I think that human rights are not only possible without religion, but in a broader sense, they may be made possible by the rejection of religion, the rejection of the claim that our worth is contingent on something external to ourselves and contingent upon what someone else decides to bestow upon us. Is, is there anything more anathema to the idea of human rights than that our worth does not exist within us, but on the permission of someone else? We might do well to define human rights as the opposite of this. Right? The history of human rights has often been a history of religious opposition, the right to equal consideration under the law against something like the Islamic doctrine of uh, a woman's testimony in court being worth half that of a man's, the right of homosexuals to live freely and express their love for their partners without clerical interference, the right to life and religious freedom too, which are simultaneously violated uh, by the Islamic doctrine uh, concerning apostasy in a Sharia state. Nature of suffering. But I think that when you consider just how pervasive suffering is into the uh, living existence of human beings. Um, almost everything that we do is essentially an attempt to avoid suffering. We eat to avoid hunger. We sleep to avoid fatigue. We, you know, uh, we research to avoid boredom. All, all of these kind of things. Our, our, our entire living existence is an attempt to get rid of this omnipresence of the potentiality for suffering. <clears throat> it's very plausible, I think, to suggest that this, is the, that this is the doing of an evil god who wants us to constantly be under this oppressive force. You, you ask the question of why wouldn't he just destroy everything if he hates it? Well, I think it's, it's more cruel to create some beings who not only kind of will be destroyed down the line, but know full well they will be. It's like, it's not, it's not just, hey, I'm going to create you and destroy you. It's like, I'm going to create you, cause you to suffer, give you absolutely no indication as to why you should continue living every single day because your life is defined by pain, and give you the knowledge as well that at the end of it, you're going to be destroyed and that you're going to spend about 80 years of your life here just toiling and struggling and fighting against this suffering uh, to eventually die. That seems to me very plausibly the work of an evil god. What we take issue with here, though, is the implication that because certain scientific innovators from hundreds of years ago were Christian, that means that contemporary versions of Christianity and contemporary science do not conflict at all. That's just false. A lot of forms of Christianity contain ideas that directly conflict with the scientific consensus. Creationism, which some Christians uphold, conflicts with the scientific consensus on evolution by natural selection. The idea that Adam and Eve were the first humans conflicts with the scientific consensus that human evolution happened on a gradual continuum, not suddenly enough to produce humans distinct from any other apes within one generation. Prayer studies have shown that prayer, Christian or otherwise, performs no better than placebo and randomized controlled trials involving the recovery rates of hospitalized test subjects. The scientific consensus in the field of psychiatry also conflicts with the idea that gay conversion therapy works or that religious intervention is effective in changing sexual orientation like some Christians believe. Basically, science demonstrates that you can't pray the gay away. Further, some Christians don't believe in human-made climate change because it goes against their theology. I was raised that way. But the scientific consensus is that climate change is happening and that humans are the primary cause. You can definitely be a scientist and be Christian, but that doesn't mean that the scientific consensus is not in significant conflict with many forms of Christian theology.